Cadets, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to get this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm delighted to be in Hellas, I'm delighted to be in Athens and at this uh, Air Force Base, the Air Force Academy. The program looks excellent and there is no place better to be than right here, right now. Let me offer my message for today. The bottom line is that we airmen are illiterate when it comes to theory, strategy and doctrine. We are smart in so many ways, masters of technology, but we are rather uneducated when it comes to conceptual thinking. Conceptual thinking is perhaps more important now than it has been in a long time because of the new security landscape. We also have a strained economy, so it requires us to rethink how we invest our force structure. It's not that we have to do more with less, it's more that we have to do things differently than we did in the past. We cannot afford to remain intellectually lazy when shaping the future air power. We have to think big. Alexander the Great did not get his nickname because he was thinking small. Part of the problem is that we have a flawed military doctrine uh, and a military mindset that is anti-air power in design. We invest in fifth generation aircraft, but we are stuck in first generation Napoleonic Clausewitzian thinking. I refer to this as the BCD complex. We are obsessed with the battle, with combat and with destruction. We are battlefield oriented and ground centric rather than air minded. We focus on war fighting rather than the real purpose of war, which is war ending and peace building. We are fixated on destroying tanks and artillery and the tactical level rather than think in terms of strategic effects. We prefer invasion and occupation to governance and control from the air. Why would you engage the enemy on the ground in a tactical red zone if you can strike from a distance? There is no honor in giving the enemy a fair chance to kill you. We need a new strategic model for our military interventions. Air, not land, must be at its center. We must begin by strengthening the relationship between policy and military operations. We must connect air power to statecraft. Let us begin with this three ring model. The outer ring refers to national strategy. It's about shaping your environment through daily activities to training and exercises. If that doesn't work, you might have to deter someone from doing something. You might have to threaten him, warn him. You might have to forward deploy. You might have to conduct no-fly zones. And worst case, if deterrence fails, we have to respond with, use, with using military force. The middle ring is the four main roles of air power. Those are constant. It's been the case since the First World War. This is how we use air power to operationalize national strategy. And I'm sure you're familiar with these four elements. We need control of the air. Let us not forget the importance of air superiority and air supremacy. We need intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, ISR. You need situational awareness. You need eyes in the sky. Maneuver and mobility. We need to get men, women, machines to and from the theater and strike, which can take many forms, strategic attack, interdiction, close air support, missions against ships and submarines. And this inner ring is professional competency. We need to foster professional mastery of air power. We have the technical skills, but we need to emphasize the core of our business, the core of our profession, which is to plan, lead and execute air campaigns. And these campaigns, take place in a political context. Let us take a quick look at history. What does the latest military engagements have in common? If we look at Operation Deliberate Force in 1995, what are we doing in Bosnia and Herzegovina today? Look at Operation Allied Force. What are we doing in Kosovo today? Look at, at Iraq and Afghanistan. What are we doing there today? 
and look at Operation Unified Protector, what are we doing in Libya today? And the simple answer is that we are conducting post-war reforms. One way or another, we are trying to establish functioning legitimate regimes in countries that we have intervened. We're trying to develop good governance. We're trying to conduct security sector reform. So if that is where we end up, why don't we think in those terms before we go to war? After all, every war must end. I define security sector reform in its broadest sense, which means that we seek some sort of stability, security, and prosperity in accordance with our NATO basic values of democracy, individual liberty, the rule of law, and human rights. We do this through integrity building, anti-corruption measures, and, and we try to establish decision-making procedures in these countries based on transparency and accountability. I'm not saying it's perfect objectives, but I'm saying it is a better state of peace, to quote Basil Little Hart. Now, when you have defined the end game, the next question deals with strategy. And strategy to me is very easy and very difficult. It is the art of winning by matching ends, ways, and means. And I suggest a twofold strategy where we look at friends and foes as system of systems. On one hand, you need to punish the bad guy. You might have to destroy something. You might have to kill someone. We are talking about war. But it's better, if you can, to paralyze the system, to uh, prevent uh, it from taking action. And you can do that, that through the strategy of paralysis. You seek to disgrade and disrupt, disintegrate and deny, disable and damage. We know this from the theories of John Warden and John Boyd and others. But if you want to change the regime, you have to think about the replacement early on, and that is the tricky part. Consequently, you need to support an alternative to the regime that you're paralyzing, and that is the strategy of empowerment. You strengthen friendly forces by educating and encouraging, by establishing and enhancing, by educating and enriching. These are the elements of empowerment. In other words, you should seek to find a strategy that strengthens friend and weakens foe. Now with that in place, with the ends and the ways in place, we can talk about means and air capabilities. And to me, it's not about flying faster, higher, or further. It's about key characteristics. It's about what air power brings to the political table. Let me offer eight elements. First, air power is unique compared to ground and naval forces when it comes to deployability. They have a very high degree of readiness. Air forces can be deployed very fast and be ready for action immediately. Second, air power is unique compared to ground and naval forces when it comes to responsiveness. We can act and react in minutes rather than days and weeks. We can return to the scene fast if the opponent does not comply. Third is scalability. Air power can be used as little or as much as you prefer. You can start and stop in seconds and minutes. You can go instant. You can go gradual. Four is accuracy. Air power can act with an unprecedented precision from a distance. We all know the old Murphy's Law. If you can hit the enemy, he can hit you. That's not necessarily true anymore. Five is lethality. You can be as lethal as you want, big or small bombs, kinetic or non-kinetic. Six, air power is not risk-free, but we can operate at lower risk to enemy li lives and own lives compared to ground forces, being in theater. Boots on the ground means casualties. Seven, you give the political masters and the military commanders a flexible tool. They get options. If you ask a politician what he wants, it's always options, options, options. And eight, you can achieve strategic rather than merely tactical effects with air power. And I suggest this is a good starting point for a new air power strategy and a doctrine that is air-minded rather than ground-centric 
This is the way out of the Freudian battle, combat, and destruction complex. And this is not parochialism. We need to think about what makes air power unique, rather than think about air power as an extension of ground warfare. And these are the unique characteristics. So this is what I mean by an air model rather than a land model. We use air power for strategic effect. Our point of departure should be to connect air power to national and international policy rather than view it in terms of the battlefield. We must seek to affect the enemy as a political, social, economic system rather than the classic military order of battle. And we have to think clearly, coherently and creatively about how to match ends, ways and means. It's fun to talk about Jas Gripen and Eurofighter and Raphael and F-22 and F-35 and Mirage, but it's necessary that we talk about concepts, strategy and doctrine. And this is the model we can build on. It might be a start. To succeed, ladies and gentlemen, we must master the air power profession itself. And here is what I suggest we do. We stop using air power as a substitute for its military predecessors. We must move away from the olden way of war. Rather, we must link air power to national policy and strategic effect. That is its rationale. Air power is a continuation of policy by other means. We must also become serious promoters of ideas rather than only machines. And we must think lateral and creative about the science and technology but we must combine the art of air power with the science of air power. And finally, this is how I suggest we do it. We need to establish intellectual hubs for mastering air power history, strategy, theory and doctrine, and move beyond the land model of today. We need to create educational campaigns for politicians to explain to them what air power brings to the table, what's in it for them. That's when they will accept to invest in air power. And consequently, we must identify a team of officer scholars whose task is to communicate the strategic value of air power to the public, to the politicians, and to fellow officers. We need to sell air power, and we should do that by presenting its record and its potential. Generals distinguished guests, colleagues and friends. In order to shape the future of air power, we must master conceptual thought. We have been conceptually illiterate and strategically blind for far too long. Our new concept must be air-centric and air-minded. The Hellenic Air Force should have an advantage because you have the tradition of philosophy and conceptual reasoning. All you have to do is identify the officers who should follow in the footsteps of Socrates, Plato, and Aristoteles. The coming together of ethos, pagos, and logos will shape the future of air power. Thank you for listening to me.